after last Sunday's lecture that was on the 17th, I had to go to Calcutta, where apart from our meetings at the Bedouin Mat, I had two, three interesting meetings. One is in the British Mission Seva Pakistan. There's a hospital of 550 beds where there was a scientific seminar. Inauguration of that at about 2 p.m. Immediately after, there was a meeting in the Ramakrishna Mission Institute of Culture, Vivekananda Auditorium, where a seminar by Vivekananda Swasthya Seva Sangha. That means a few medical people organized into a service organization to serve the weaker sections, especially in the rural areas, along with their practice and earning money for themselves, inspired by Swamiji's idea of service. That was a very wonderful experience for all who participated. Doctors had gone from Madras, Dr. Ramurthy, neurologist, from here, Dr. Ramesh Pai, from Bombay, Kutaris, Mr. and Mrs. Delhi, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Dr. Tandon, and from Calcutta, many distinguished doctors and young doctors among the audience also. About 600 people restricted entry. It went on from 4 o'clock to 7.30. Various questions about responsibilities of doctors to the poorer patients. What does Vivekananda say on the subject? And then after the panel, members spoke questions from the audience. So for three and a half hours, it was a very exciting experience for all concerned. And they have taken a video of the whole show. If it comes here, we shall have occasion to see it. But the main thing is, this spirit of service slowly invading groups of people here and there. That is a wonderful experience, and I'm sure it will catch up with our problems. That was on 23rd afternoon. An additional item was on Sunday, 24th morning. A lecture at the Indian Institute of Management in Calcutta. That was a last minute arrangement. For the first time I was going there, and for the students there also, coming from all over India, it was the first time they were hearing something new. They asked me what subject you will speak. I said, I will speak on a subject which you don't get taught anywhere here. I will speak on that how to develop character, how to develop love for man, the spirit of service and dedication. And then questions came towards the end. That was a very wonderful experience. Then Sunday evening, a Bengali lecture in one of the ashramas, where in a house about 600 people had gathered, first floor, second floor, third floor, arranging all here, there, everywhere. That was also a very happy experience. Many devotees had gathered together there, and I spoke on Sri Ramakrishna. So all this was a wonderful experience, along with the meetings of the Bedur Mat and meeting with so many people. I was to return on Vyasa Purnima Day, 29th, but I finished meetings earlier, came on 28th itself, so that I could be here for this spiritual retreat that we had about 180 people on 29th morning. Today we have to begin the second chapter of the Gita. Before entering into it, I wish to point out a small correction in what I said 
last time, dealing with the word Rakodara, the name of Bhima, in verse 15, I had referred to Braga probably as a pig or something. Actually, it is a wolf. Uh, his hunger is like a wolf. He could eat and digest everything. That is Bhima, so Vrgodara. And second was verse 17, where Drishtadyumna is actually the son of the king of Drupada, Anchara. That is Drishtadyumna. So these two corrections are needed. And because I suspect that it was not correctly put on the 17th evening lecture. We left Arjuna in the last verse of the first chapter, sunk in the chariot, completely depressed. The language used in the last verse is very, very expressive on this question. The chapter itself is called Arjuna's grief or depression. Arjuna, Vishada, Yoga. The last yoga and Sunday has said, Eva Muktu Arjuna Sankhi, Dathopastha Upavishat. Having said this, in the midst of the battle, Arjuna sat down, the chariot, sat down in the chariot, sank into the chariot. Generally, when they fight, they stand up. That was the custom in those days. Standing up and fighting. Sitting down means no more fighting. So, Rathopastha Upavishat. Visrigyas Sasharam Chapam. He threw away his bows and arrows. That is complete negation of the purpose of which he has come there. Shoka Samvikna Manasaha. Mind was immersed in Shoka, grief, dejection. That is the state of Arjuna described in the last verse which we studied on the 17th evening here. Now we begin the second chapter. How did Krishna react to this state of Arjuna's mind and the various arguments Arjuna gave for running away from the field of battle? Some of the arguments appeal to us also. All over the world today, nobody likes war. So in Australia, America, and Europe, people ask me this question. Arjuna seems to be better than Krishna. He wants to have peace. He doesn't want war. Krishna is egging him to war. How can we accept this situation? I said, that's correct. Arjuna is speaking of peace, non-violence, compassion. And Krishna is asking him to give up these things. But what does it mean? What is the state of Arjuna's mind? Is there any virtue in Arjuna's state of the mind? Is virtue weakness? Is virtue nervous breakdown? We have to ask that question. Virtue is strong. It's made of stern stuff in the language of Shakespeare. Virtue must be made of stern stuff. That stern stuff you don't find in Arjuna in that condition. He is only invoking these wonderful ideas of love and compassion and non-violence, etc. But his own condition was very pitiable. Absolutely, what you call it today, a psychic breakdown. Krishna looked at him and then the book will say, with a smile, began to speak to him. How to restore this man to his own true state of mind? He is not like this, but it has come to him just now. This depression, this weakness, virtue must be made of sterner stuff. Character must be made of sterner stuff. Non-violence also must be made of sterner stuff. Even Mahatma Gandhi would say, I don't like the non-violence of the coward. Non-violence of the brave alone is non-violence. Gandhiji said this. And so, Krishna looked at Arjuna and in two famous verses, debunked him. Whatever he thought was right, Krishna showed that was not correct. You cannot judge properly with your sick mind or grief-stricken mind. A grief-stricken mind loses discrimination. 
you must be more calm and steady then you will understand your situation better and so this part of the second chapter is very vital in the study of the gita krishna teaching us not to run away from the battle of life it is easy to run away various arguments also we can produce and we have done also suppose you have trouble at home you simply run away to banaras some people say you are wonderful so full of pronunciation but krishna won't say so you are a weakling you are not seeing your own duty you are escaping from all this there is a manliness about man that should not be forgotten so all these various life situations come to us and krishna and today swami vivekananda will ask us to face up to these problems bring up new energies from within in this way a positivistic attitude a positive attitude is given to us and the mind is made stable and steady to see things clearly what is your duty at a particular time we must be able to find out this arjuna was confused he was dejected his judgment has no value at all and so sanjaya begins the second chapter with this statement tam tatha kripaya avishtam ashrapurna kulekshanam vishidantam idam vakyam uvacha madhusudanah madhusudanah uvacha madhusudana said that means krishna said what did he say idam vakyam this utterance krishna said that is to be repeated in the next two verses what krishna said but he said this to whom to arjuna what kind of arjuna vishidantam deeply grieving vishidantam then kripaya avishtam full of pity a pitiable condition arjuna who was in a pitiable condition kripaya avishtam and not only so ashrapurna avilekshana tears coming streaming from the eyes of arjuna these are not signs of strength or stability or courage not at all ashrapurna avilekshana vishidantam grieving that kind of arjuna krishna spoke these words so you can see the psychological state of arjuna's mind it was highly pathological not healthy the healthy mind won't be like this that's what we have to learn first weeping and wailing seeing some problem is not a healthy condition we yeah, certainly if the problems are too much beyond our control then we shall have to weep and wail but if you can you must try and face up to these problems there are occasions when you cannot face a problem and if you can in the stage in one place i shall either fight the problem or recourse to flight from the problem there is no harm in flying away provided you have done your best to face up to it and this is a positive attitude krishna is going to bring this attitude to arjuna and then in the context of this he expounds a wonderful philosophy of life for all people to people in australia america or europe who refer to the question of war why krishna asked arjuna to go to war and kill people you should have said arjuna what you said is correct go home wear some poor dress and take bhiksha from house to house and live as a dig life you could have told that 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 won't be a solution running away from problems will not be a solution because problems will be chasing you all the time you have to face up some time or the other that wonderful idea is coming in krishna's two verses of reply bhagwan vacha shri krishna said kutastva kashpanam idam vishame samupasthitam anadi dushtam aswargyam akirti garam arjuna simple sanskrit full of meaning kutastva kutam is where from swam means to you 
Vaivam has come to you. Kashpalam, this very low attitude. Kashpala is the word in Sanskrit for all that is bad. Kashmalam. Vishame Samapastitam. In the most difficult situation, you have brought up this kind of argument and developed this attitude. Vishame Samapastitam. See the situation. In the midst of two armies, battle is to begin. At this moment, you say, no, I cannot. I am going away. I am going to Rishikesh. That kind of saying, you know. Vishame Samapastitam. Then, an Adhijushtam, a noble-minded person, will not adopt this way. Aryas. Arya is not a race. Arya is a noble-minded person. But they often confuse the word Arya with a race. There is no Aryan race. In the beginning, Western historians propounded this theory, the Aryan race. That developed into Hitler's Aryan superiority. And when Hitler died, Aryan theory also died. But Arya is used in Sanskrit always for the noble-minded person. Take in a Sanskrit drama. The person will address the character as my dear Arya, or noble-minded person. And Buddha spoke of his teachings as Arya Satyani, noble truths. The word noble is the word for Arya there. The four noble truths, Arya Satyani. So the word Arya is used by Buddha also as also by earlier Vedic literature. And this word Arya, therefore, is a very great word in our Sanskrit. Be an Aryan means be noble-minded. Don't be petty. Don't be small. So he calls it an Aryajushtam. The attitude you have adopted is not adopted by Aryas. Only those who are not Arya, ignoble people, adopt your attitude. An Aryajushtam. Asvargyam. It won't give you any glory. Either in heaven or in the earth, you don't have any glory thereby. Asvargyam. Akirtikaram. Also it brings you bad name. Ill fame. Arjuna was a great warrior. He has fallen a prey to weakness. Your name will suffer in the world. An Aryajushtam. Asvargyam. Akirtikaram. Arjuna. That is the first. Something like a Shock treatment or Arjuna. In our mental breakdown, nervous breakdown, we are given shock treatments. So here is Krishna's shock treatment or Arjuna, the first one. Arjuna never expected. He expected Krishna would pat on his back. Arjuna, you have done well. You are such a noble soul, having a passion to everybody. Don't want to kill anybody. You would rather be a mendicant than be a fighter. All that was expected by Arjuna. Did not come from Krishna. He scolds him, gives him this kind of shock treatment. That is negative. Now comes the positive. Krishna is saying the next verse: "Klaipiyam masma dhamma partha, naitatvai upavadyate, chudram pradyadavur belliyam tetva puttishta parantapa." That is a powerful verse. Klaipiyam mean chicken-heartedness. You can say. Weakness. That's called Clypeum. Absolutely no strength, no manliness, nothing in it. Masma gamma parta. Don't fall a prey to this meanness, this chicken heartedness, O Arjuna. Clypeum masma gamma parta. Why? Neither tvai upapatyate. Doesn't befit you. You are so heroic. You are so noble. You are so great. This behavior doesn't befit you. What a wonderful idea, this wonderful suggestion. Naita Tvai Upapadyate. Whenever I read this part of the verse, I like this wonderful sentiment. Parents telling children, it doesn't befit you. You are so good, you are so noble. The way, the way you behave doesn't befit you. That will bring the best out of a person. So this concept of Naita Tvai Upapadyate, it doesn't befit you, can be an educational maxim for parents and teachers with respect to children and generally for men and women when they deal with each other. This behavior doesn't befit you. That means you respect the person. He has forgotten his true nature. He is doing something below his dignity, his own natural state of mind. So this appeal is a positive appeal. 
It has the power to evoke the best in you, in best in the listener. So Krishna is telling Arjuna, this is not your true form. Some maya has come upon your mind. This weakness, this dejection, this particular nervous breakdown, that's not your true form. When we have a nervous breakdown, how weak we become. Like a baby, I had to deal with a very close friend, principal of an engineering college, noble-minded person, highly respected by all the students and teachers. When I was in Karachi, he got nervous breakdown. The condition was just like a baby. Absolutely no strength, no energy, no courage. Can't meet anybody. He won't go to college. He will live at home. I took him in the car, took him to the college, engineering college, made him sit on the principal's chair. You run this college. You are such a great soul, so noble. As soon as I left, he also left and came and sat in the house. He couldn't meet anybody. But after six months, everything changed. All strength came back. That was just a, what you call a cloud coming over the sun, a temporary cloud. The real man came out again. Same wonderful work went on. He built and developed two more engineering colleges of repartition within India. Later on, he passed away. Uh, see this condition, nervous breakdown, you become nobody. Your old self is dead. Actually, it is not dead. It is there. It is clouded by this weakness that has come. And so we go to a psychiatrist. He deals with us and somehow he puts us into some sort of a good condition. This we see plenty happening every day. This concept of man is essentially divine. All this weakness that you experience is not your true form. There is something profound about you. That's the basic Vedantic teaching. That is why when Vivekananda was asked in America during question hour, Swami, are you not preaching some sort of hypnotism to people in the name of Vedanta? Just hypnotizing people? Swami immediately with a smile said, No, sir. I am dehypnotizing the people. They are already hypnotized. <laughs> they say, I am white, I am black, I am this, I am that. All that is false. You are the infinite Atman, one with all. That is your true dimension. Tattvamasi, Tattvamasi. You are that. You are that. Not this tiny organic system. Something profound about you. So all education has this quality. It dehypnotizes you. Some weakness has come. And he said, that's not your true form. You are essentially strong. You have the infinite strength behind you. How do you know? How many varieties of energies and strengths are within you? You don't know. Therefore, don't despair. You can't get out of this difficulty. There is strength hidden within you. There's a positive attitude. Vedanta proclaims to everyone. Here Krishna stands on that pedestal and then addresses Arjuna and says, Naitatvai Upavadyade. It doesn't befit you. It's just a temporary aberration of your mind. A little cloud has come there and the sun has become dark. Sun is still there. Cloud can go and sun can shine once again. That is how you deal with human weakness. We are not essentially weak. We are essentially strong. But when we don't realize this truth, we weep and weep and weep for every problem. Like children, for example. A little problem. Somebody snatched away something from the hand. He goes on weeping. His only language is weeping. Nothing else is there. We become children. Even grown-ups become children. And Swami Vivekananda's diagnosis of India during the last several centuries is a nation constantly weeping, weeping, weeping. Then he said, no more weeping now. We have wept long enough. Stand on your feet and be men. This is a famous passage in Vivekananda literature. For everything we wept, the whole nation has been weeping due to a sense of inadequacy with respect to the environment. We didn't know our own strength. Slowly that is changing. Problems are there, yes. But I shall find resources to deal with these problems. 
in this way that weeping state of India is changing now. No more weeping. We shall have to manifest our strength face up to these problems. So Vivekananda said nearly 88 years ago, we have wept long enough. No more weeping now. Stand up and be men. Don't weep even in joy, he said. Weeping is no virtue. And so, when I went to Jakarta, 1963-64, Vivekananda Centenary Time, Dr. Sukarno, President, he wrote a foreword to a book on Vivekananda in Indonesian language, Swara Vivekananda. Swara means in Sanskrit, sound, musical sound. There it means, Swara means words. Words of Vivekananda. Sanskrit is very much in Indonesian language. So words or sayings of Vivekananda. He wrote an introduction. And we were having a one-hour TV session to release that book. Indian ambassador, Appa Pant also was there as his guest. In that introduction occurs this wonderful passage. Because Sukarno was deeply influenced by Swamiji's ideas from his young days. He always had complete works of Vivekananda in his bedroom. And he told me, you can go to the bedroom, you will find all the volumes are there. I read a page or two every day, he said. So in that passage, the fourth word, he says, Swami Vivekananda, ah, what a name. He was the one who taught me how to love my people, how to love my country, how to love the whole world. He was the one who said, then quotation, we have wept long enough. No more weeping now, but stand on your feet and be men. He was Sukarno. That is the introduction. That book was in English as well as in the Indonesian language. So this attitude, which Krishna expressed then, found a new expression in our time in Swami Vivekananda. And he loved these two verses very much in his discourse on the Gita. He says, if you can understand the spirit of these two verses, you understand the spirit of the Gita. It is a strong philosophy meant to make heroes out of clay. This spirit must be captured by our people. We could do so. We were all reading the Gita. But the spirit did not catch us. We didn't catch the spirit all this time. Now Swamiji has come and given us the same message of strength, fearlessness, facing up to problems. And in his lectures in England and America on Jnana Yoga, he referred to this particular truth in terms of his own experience. Somewhere in Benares also, he was chased by a number of monkeys. He was then in the wandering, as a wandering monk, going around India. Number of monkeys, they were very fierce monkeys in Benares. They chased him and he was running. From a distance, an old sadhu shouted at him, Babaji, don't run away. Face the brutes, face the brutes. Swamiji thought so wonderful teaching. He immediately turned back and turned towards these monkeys in a fierce look and the monkeys fled away. He referred to the story and said, face the brute, face the brute. Otherwise, if you run away, the brute will be chasing you throughout your life. That is not manliness. Man has got much better capacity hidden within him. So, this Krishna's tonic to Arjuna it's a tonic we all need. The whole nation and the world itself will need it. So in the second shloka, Krishna said, Klaipyam Masma Gamak Partha. Don't give to, give, give, give in to Klaipyam. Actually it means a neuter. What you call? A Nabhum Sagalinga. Neither man nor woman. It is called Klaipya. Weakness. Chicken heartedness, all that meaning attaches to this word klaibya. Klaibya masma gama partha. Naidatvai upapadyate. Doesn't befit you. You are such a noble nature, heroism, courage, 
everything you have. Then, Chudram Hrde Daurbalyam Tektva Uttishtha Parantava. He was sitting down, broken, sunk in the chariot, in that condition. Krishna says, stand up, stand up. The first sign that strength has come to you is when you stand up. When you are still lying down, that old weakness is still there. So stand up, stand up is a big word in dealing with a human being. Stand on your feet. Stand on your feet, be men. So this Klaibhyam, give it up, Dikshudram Hrdeva Daurbalya, this weakness of the heart, which is Chudram, which is mean, giving it up. Arjuna, stand up, face up to your problems. This is what Krishna tells to Arjuna and to all of us when we are in difficulties and we don't know our strength. We are stretching, stretching. We think we cannot go anymore or we will break down. Then somebody has to come and give us new strength. That strength is there, but somebody must do the touch. Then only it will manifest. We all need it. In fact, in your life you can see if a man is weak, you go and strengthen him by a few words, then he really feels stronger. Somebody has come and told something positive, your strength increases thereby. Even appreciating a person increasing his, increases his strength. It is said in Ramayana, when people were sent to search for Sita here and there, Hanuman was asked, go south, you will succeed. Hanuman took up the job, then Angada or somebody praised Hanuman. You are such a great soul. You have such great achievements in your life. All that made Hanuman feel greater and greater confidence in himself. In social relations, you can do two things to each other. Either destroy one's confidence or increase that self-confidence. Mostly we have done the negative thing in India. We have destroyed each other's self-confidence. But the other thing is more important. How to strengthen the self-confidence of that individual? Speak of his great achievements, great attainments, this and that. That will immediately feel, make, make, make him feel, yes, I can, I can. In the case of Hanuman, it happened. Himself a great soul. But he got, he got new accession of strength when this kind of speech from Angada and others about his own achievements made him feel stronger and stronger. So this is what Krishna is dealing with Arjuna. In this way, stand up. Face up to your problems. Don't become weak. Any type of weakness has no virtue about it. One great lesson Vedanta tells us, weakness and virtue can no, never go together. Virtue is strength. Weakness is no virtue at all. We think weakness is virtue, not at all. Weakness, courage, all these are needed for virtue. Where there is no courage, there is no virtue. That's why virtuous vira. Vira is a great word in Sanskrit, heroic. There only you find virtue. In weak people, where is virtue? So the concept of dharma and then virtue, even goodness, all this must be associated with strength and fearlessness. Then only they become positive. We somehow did not do so. Any good for nothing person, we will say he is a good man. That's very often we find a good for nothing person is a good man. Because it doesn't harm anybody. That's the idea. It doesn't harm anybody. A good boy. Harmless. He has not the power to harm anybody. So where is goodness in it? Where is virtue in it? So this is how our judgment went wrong for a few centuries. That's why I sometimes tell people coming and saying, if there is a good or nothing boy in one's house, or if the parents will come to the ashram, Swamiji, here is a boy, take for sannyas. He will be very good for you. <laughs> that is not good for the world. It's not good for here also. <laughs> that they forget. So our whole thinking has been defective in this matter. That heroic attitude was not there. Strength and fearlessness was not there. And today Vivekananda comes. 
and preaches only this one message, strength and fearlessness. Abhi, Abhi, Abhi. Jivahala Nehru writes about this message of Swamiji in his discovery of India. He gave a spirit of courage to our people, a strength, a spirit of manliness. There's the biggest contribution from the great teacher. And so, we need this kind of teaching today in a big way. In olden days, Krishna gave it. Where a picture of strength, picture of fearlessness, and the whole of Vedanta is a message of strength and fearlessness. Never you will find any stress on weakness in Vedanta. Always Abhi, Abhi, Abhi. Abhi means be fearless, be fearless, be fearless. Brahman is Abhayam. God is called Abhayam. What is the name of God? Fearlessness. And when you attain God, you become fearless. So, Abhayam Vai Praptosi Janakaha. Rudharanika Upanishad says, Yajimalkya, telling to Janaka, the emperor, Janaka, you have achieved the state of fearlessness. That is your spiritual development. Through fearlessness, you develop spiritually. Through weakness, you never. Animals are all weak. They are creatures. Man can become fearless by realizing his own true nature. So this one virtue, Vivekananda says, from every page, the Upanishads preach only one message to me. Fearlessness and strength. Are you strong? Are you strong? Then he adds, the human heart asks this question. Are there no human weaknesses? Vedanta says, yes, there are. There are human weaknesses. But can you remove weakness by weakness? Weakness can be removed only through strength. Dirt cannot wash dirt. Only pure water can wash dirt. So, another weakness cannot remove the existing weakness. Strength alone is the remedy for the world's disease. And that is the message of Vedanta. The more spiritual you become, the more fearless and strong you will become. And the more compassionate you become. You combine two great virtues, fearlessness and compassion. In all the Indian literature, you find this confluence of two difficult virtues, difficult to coexist, intense fearlessness, intense compassion. You can be fearful so that others are frightened of you, or you can be so weak, anybody can frighten you. These extremes we have seen, but this rare combination is highlighted in the whole of our great literature. And in this very book, when you come to the 12th chapter, Krishna will tell it, who is my true devotee? The one who is strong and fearless, and yet he is compassionate to all beings. Nobody need fear him. He doesn't fear anybody, but nobody need fear him also, because he is so gentle. That is the sign of spiritual growth, spiritual realization. So that the whole subject of man, his growth, development, fulfillment, is what Krishna is handling in these 18 chapters. As I told the Australian, American, other friends, war is only in the first chapter. Afterward, you don't remember the word war at all. It's only the big problem of human development that Krishna handles throughout. And therefore, this is not a book on war. This is a book of human development and fulfillment. High character energy coming out of the human being. What is the philosophy that will help me to develop that kind of a character? A character which contains these two elements in a confluence, as it were. Intense strength, intense gentleness. These two. Similarly, tremendous broad-mindedness and intensity of faith and conviction. These two also cannot often coexist. I'm a cosmopolitan, people say. When you examine, you will find he has no particular conviction. He is all things to all men because he is nobody himself. That kind of cheap cosmopolitan attitude some people adopt because there is no depth. His width is there, but no depth. There are people full of depth, but they are fanatical. They hold to their own, criticize everybody else. That kind of depth you have seen. 
Prabhupada Swamiji said, Vedanta wants you to have depth plus breadth, broad attitude and deep convictions. If you can combine these two, then you have the best of character. We shall be deep as the ocean and broad as the skies. These are the words he has used. Can you become so? Then you have the highest character. Vedanta wants to instill that kind of a character in all people all over the world. So here you have a profound philosophy of human growth, development, and fulfillment that cannot come to you when you are in a depressed state of mind, when you are nervous and mentally broken, until you become somewhat normal. This message cannot come to you. So Krishna is giving the first initial tonic to Arjuna's broken mind through these two verses. And the tonic had the effect. When Krishna spoke these words, Arjuna became somewhat thoughtful, somewhat composed in mind. He could speak a little more coherently thereafter. That's what you will see here after Arjuna's words. A little coherence comes when that depression is no more there. Krishna has removed it by these powerful words which acted as a tonic to the grief-stricken mind of Arjuna. And with a little more calmness, little more rationality, he is putting forth his arguments in his reply to Krishna's exhortation. That is the subject of verses 4 to 9 or so in this second chapter. When Krishna said this, says, Klaityam Masma Gamapatha Naitatvai Upapadhyade Tattu of problems. That's what he said. Face up. He will use this again and again later on. What Upanishad said in the Kathopanishad, which is studied here, third chapter, Uttishtata, Jagrata, Prapyavaran, Nibodhata, rise, awake, and stop not till the goal is reached. What a beautiful concept of human life. Marching, marching, marching. Flowing water is clean and pure. A stagnant pool is a source of trouble. So also is a stagnant life, stagnant mind. That wonderful idea of creativity comes through this teaching. So having administered this tonic, made Arjuna's mind a little more calm and steady, what you saw at the end of the first chapter and what you will see now, you will find a lot of difference. He is speaking a little more coherent language. He can control his feelings. Controlling feelings is the beginning of human mental development. No animal can control feelings. Whenever feelings come, they express automatically their feeling in action. But man can control feelings, then try to understand the environment, then adapt himself to that situation. So controlling feelings is the first step in thinking, in clear thinking. Otherwise, the clouded thinking, when you have feelings, you will find mind is clouded. When your feelings are slightly calmed, then clear thinking begins. This is the dictate of neurology. Animals cannot control their feelings. The first step to gain control of the environment is controlling a feeling. You see a foot, you jump at it. You see something, jump at it or run away from it. All simple feelings all the time. But man alone can watch, study, think, roll in his mind the consequences of things. That means he is controlling his feeling, which may not straight away express itself in action. After thinking about it, then he will express itself in thoughtful action. That's how man controls the environment, which no animal can do. Even the chimpanzee cannot have a fraction of the capacity, which you see in man, says neurologist Gray Walter. And therefore, Arjuna is now in a more equable frame of mind. Later on, in the middle of the second chapter, when Krishna begins expounding his own philosophy of life, he will say, this equable mind is essential. A balanced mind, essential. Samatva, the word is samatva. These emotions and feelings inside, just calm them down a little. Then you can see things clearly. Otherwise, it will be like life in Delhi, when there is a dust storm. They call it Andhi. You can't see anything. The whole 
sky is full of dust. You can't see anything. They call it anthi. Literally, it is anthi. 